kind of, I think it'll be easier to get access to the chart in terms of this if we translate these four functions into their archetypes, which is a technique that Hillman will teach us when we get to him, which is uh, the process of seeing through concepts to their indwelling archetypes. Theoretically, according to Hillman, um, these two types of thinking will turn out to be artificial because conceptual thinking will turn out to be motivated by archetypes, and so mythic images will be concealed in the sterile language of discursive thought. So theoretically, it ought to be capable of translating these back into their indwelling archetypes, and so I was playing with this over the weekend, and I think uh, what it looks like here is, of course, thinking we have Mercury, and feeling we have Venus, and sensation we have Mars and or Saturn, and intuition is, of course, Neptune, you know, thinking in terms of pictures and images. That, oh, I wanted to finish the thought about uh, sensation. He said, uh, so what his response to finding out his own personal myth was, well, I thought of what I like to do as a child that made the hours pass, what I did spontaneously. And he remembered back how he liked to play with little stones and make little villages and build things. So he said, well, I found myself as a 40-year-old man uh, acting out this infantile fantasy, and I began to build things again. And it just... I didn't know why I was doing it, and I felt totally foolish doing it, and it was a humiliating experience for me, but I knew that I had to do it. And so that builder archetype is um, Mars and Saturn, which is, he has uh, Mars sextile Saturn in his chart. That is the sensation function, the relationship to the exterior world in terms of building. But it takes him a lot longer to begin to bring up the feeling function. Now in terms of... Uh, Isn't that the builder? Mars sextile Saturn? Yes. Okay. Mars sextile Saturn, yes. So we've already seen he's got the Neptune transit going on, and as the Neptune transit comes in, he begins to shift over from Mercury to Neptune, from directed thinking to the passive thinking, as the dreams and visions begin to come to him. And then in 1914, as he begins playing with these uh, sticks and stones and so forth, um, Mars transits in opposition to his uh, Saturn, I believe. Saturn transits in opposition to his Mars, his natal Mars, right about the time that he begins to bring up the sensation function, which is his third function, and starts building things, and uh, brings up the myth of the builder, and he realizes in doing that what the point of it was. It takes him a while, but he starts translating that into doing these little paintings and drawing these mandala images, and he begins to realize, yes, part of the whole process of becoming healthy is activating the imagination through creativity. And it doesn't make any difference whether you're writing poems or drawing or building. It makes no difference what the aesthetic quality of the material is. You shouldn't enter into it as though you were trying to be Beethoven or Shakespeare or whoever. It is simply that we are inherently creative and a huge amount of the neuroses as well as psychoses that happen to us are a result of our not ever allowing some kind of creative outlet. And so that's what begins to ease him into the whole, what he calls the transcendent function, which is the fifth function here, which is the function of individuation, the beginning of harmonizing thinking with feeling, sensation with intuition. That is the process of balancing the psyche. As far as Jung is concerned, the psyche as a whole is homeostatic, like the body. It automatically strives to balance itself. Whatever your thinking about in the daytime, the opposite of that will be what you dream about at night. What you've forgotten, what you're not paying attention to, that's what you dream about, and that's also what you will project into whatever creative activity is that you're doing. That's why it's very important to engage in a creative activity because you are embodying your unconscious. You are making it visible before you so you can see what's going on inside of you. Uh, with respect to that balancing principle. He said, one time I had a, uh, I had a patient and uh, the analysis had come to a standstill and I recognized a certain shallowness in our dialogue and uh, I couldn't figure out how to, how to get it going again. So he said, uh, well, I'll just find out what I dream about tonight. So he has this dream that his patient appears and she's up on this mountain and he's looking all the way up at her and he says he woke up with a crick in his neck because he was looking up at her so high. And then when he woke up, he said, well, 
Now, what really is my attitude toward this patient when I'm analyzing her? And he began to realize that he was actually rather condescending toward her, that he tended to look down on her in their analysis. And so he realized that the dream was giving him the correction in his attitude toward her. He, sh he should increase his estimation of her. And then he says, when I told her this, our analysis got started again and, thing and the flow began to go. So he gradually begins to figure out what the unconscious is doing. And he evolves this theory of the transcendent function, which is more or less equivalent to the individuation process of balancing the different areas of the psyche with each other. But the balance is not something that can be rushed into because it's always at the cost or the expense of the differentiated functions. So if you want to bring up sensation, it has to be at the cost of intuition and vice versa, depending on which comes easier to you. In my case, I'm an introvert, card carrying. <laughs> and uh, in my case, I actually started as an intuitive type because I grew up uh, writing short stories. Intuition was how I, I normally thought. I fantasized constantly. And so I wrote fiction and short stories. And so I was an introvert, intuitive type. But uh, as I came into college and I became interested, as I shifted from an English major to studying the works of Joseph Campbell, I began to get, become more analytical and I read the first nonfiction book in my life in uh, college, and uh, it began, I began to realize, well, nonfiction isn't so bad after all. It's kind of creative if you pick the right book. So I started following that path, and the more I followed it, the further away I got from intuition, and the more my thinking function began to come in. And uh, over time, I gradually lost the ability to just sit and write short stories, to, and I'm at the point where I just can't do it anymore without enormous difficulties. Occasionally I can still do it, but uh, it, it doesn't come the way it did uh, uh, growing up. And that went on all the way through college. I won a short story contest in college. I mean, I was very good at it. But now I could, you couldn't pay me to just sit down and do that. So there's this expenditure of energy here, the, this trade-off. That's why in a society such as ours, Jung says, one must differentiate one of these functions. It's absolutely essential to surviving in a specialized society. He says the primitive man in whom all of these functions are relatively balanced are also all archaic. They're at a less differentiated form of development. And so these functions will all come easier to him, but they will not be as complex. And so uh, in a differentiated civilization, they, they have to be. Uh, but then that sets up imbalances in the psyche, and you get the tension between conscious and unconscious. And the tension between opposites is what drives the potential of the psyche. And he says that enormous tension in Western civilization between Thinking sensation, Western civilization is extroverted. Thinking sensation, and there's an enormous tension between intuition and feeling. And so astrology isn't studied in uh, schools, and uh, the esoteric traditions are discredited and so forth because they're in the, the unconscious of Western civilization. They have, they have become the undifferentiated material of our civilization. Other civilizations, uh, it's not the case. But none of them have differentiated thinking and sensation to the degree that we have. So they don't have the kinds of machines that we have. Now it's interesting, uh, before we get to the birth chart, Young says uh, thinking and sensation give you science, the two combined together. Thinking and intuition will give you philosophy, which is normally speculative and does not necessarily have to have recourse to laboratory experiments. And intuition combined with feeling will give you religion and myth. He says this peculiar thing that I haven't figured out yet about sensation and feeling, that it gives rise to emotional feeling. And if you can figure that out, please explain it to me. So those are the uh, combinations of the functions. And uh, as I said, Western civilization is uh, thinking and sensation. India is intuition and thinking, although intuition is primary, thinking is secondary. There's no sensation function in India at all. They have no relationship to the physical world whatsoever, um, and so forth. Um, question. Yes. Uh, you said that Germany, I mean, you know, two world wars. I mean, could you give a model on that? I mean, is that? That would be a whole other lecture. Oh, so, uh, okay. never mind. <laughs> um, yeah, so I just want to then look at the, the birth charts. So we looked at the transits with respect to him uh, going into this process. 